a massive new interstellar traveler has entered our solar system and it is nothing like the quiet wanderers were used to. First flagged on September 12, 2025 by the SWAN instrument aboard SOHO, the object exploded into view with a tail so huge you could measure it with your hand. About two and a half degrees across the sky, roughly five full moons wide. Within 48 hours, Australian comet hunter Michael Martiazau captured an image that stopped people in their tracks. This wasn't another faint visitor from the dark. It looked like a spectacle, blazing toward the sun with a ferocity that made recent comet shows feel humble. The International Astronomical Union moved quickly and named it C2025R2 SWAN. The name settled the label, not the nerves, because 3I ATLS, the third confirmed interstellar object ever seen, was already inbound on its own path. Two unrelated travellers from different corners of the sky converging on the inner solar system in the same month. For many astronomers, the timing felt less like chance and more like choreography. Even before people started arguing about what the objects are, they were arguing about the odds. The physical contrast between them is striking. Swan's tail is a clean luminous blade stretching about five full moons wide. Set against that dazzling sweep, 3i ATLS's needle-thin plume looks almost shy. A tail that size means tremendous mass loss or tremendous energy, far beyond the gentle boiling you see in a typical comet. Some observers, cautiously, have suggested it may not be simple sunlight warming eyes. The tail's steadiness and definition hint at something more controlled, even if the safest word for now is still unusual. Their orbits make the story stranger. 3i ATLS came in from Sagittarius, near the galactic center. Swan streaked in from Aquarius, across the sky. And yet both are set to skim the sun within days of each other in late October. Swan near Earth's orbital distance, about 150 million kilometers. 3i ATLS much closer, around 23 million kilometers. In solar system terms, that's a razor-thin separation, about 50 million kilometers. Worse for us, both will slide behind the sun's glare at almost the same time. For Earth-based telescopes, that's a curtain during the most important scene. Blackout windows always make the heart rate rise. When the two reappear, their paths might be unchanged or they could be altered by gravity, by hate-driven jets or by something we haven't modeled yet. Some imagine near misses and sparkling outbursts. Others worry about fragmentation. A break near perihelion could seed the inner system with fresh debris. Beautiful as meteors, risky for spacecraft. Whatever happens behind the glare will teach us something about comet physics. Or it could force us to widen the frame and ask harder questions about what comet even means in a galaxy this large. 3i ATLS already forced some of those questions. Spectra from multiple teams reported strong nickel lines and unusually faint iron a split that's rare in cosmic dust where the two metals are bound together. Energy estimates based on activity and heat flow suggested some tidy power budget buried inside, on the order of gigawatts. Its tail sometimes behaved like a narrow jet with a fixed flow speed rather than a chaotic spray. And at just right heating, several observers saw a sharp color flip from red to green coinciding with a small path tweak. Harvard's Avi Loeb called it thrust mix modulation. Critics called it a coincidence. Either way, the pattern has been hard to ignore. SWAN escalates everything. Early reports, some still passing through peer review, speak of a shimmering plasma sheath around the core, a steady tail with micro pulses that resemble core strims, and an energy budget that dwarfs anything we've flown. The most eye-popping number floating through conference hallways is a core output claim in the tens of thousands of gigawatts. That's the kind of number that makes even dramatists sit down. If any of it holds up, the Fortress vs. Scout shorthand, SWAN as the powerhouse and 3i ATLS as the nimble probe, writes itself. Do we know those numbers are right? Not yet. This is the uncomfortable place where data, caution and imagination share a room. Many pieces can be tested. Tail micropulses either keep time night after night or they don't. A plasma sheath either bends the solar wind in ways instruments can record or it doesn't. Infrared heat maps either show neat plateaus that don't track sunlight or they don't. The work ahead of October and after will move claims from rumor to result. One orbit solution drops a different kind of chill into the conversation. SWAN R2 may be bound to the sun on an ellipse roughly 22,554 years long. 
If that holds, the last time it swept by, humans were stumbling into agriculture and carving stone in ways that still baffle us. 3i ATLS is the opposite, a flyby on a hyperbola, in and gone for good. A bound fortress and a one-time scout arriving together feels like a plot device. It could just be the universe being weird. It could be a system. That's why three frameworks are making the rounds. The first is the maintenance run. A long period visitor returns to drink from the sun's power, recalibrate hidden stations across the system, sync with the network embedded in ice and rock, then leave. The sun is a battery and a beacon. The second is the recovery. 3i ATLS scouts ahead. Swan follows to collect its data, salvage its core or quietly retire it before curious primates get too close. The third is the rivalry. Two factions converging on the same resource, using our star's energy and fields for work we don't have words for yet. They might not even be the same side. Ancient cycles creep into the room whether you invite them or not. A 22,000 year return brushes the end of the last ice age. That's when we started stacking stones, tracking stars and telling time in the sky. Pyramid shafts point to Orion. Stone circles take off procession. The mainstream reads culture into that, not contact. That's the right default. But if Swan really is a precise returning visitor, it isn't crazy to picture someone looking up, watching a five-moon tail scream across the heavens and carving a memory into the only hard drive they had. Stone. There's a modern trigger too. Us. For a century, Earth has been leaking and shouting. Radio and TV. Planetary radar. Arecibo's message, Voyager's golden records. That bubble is now 100 light years wide. If someone listens, an audit by machines makes sense. Not a welcome, a systems check. Oumuamua glides through in 2017. Dark, silent, odd. 3i ATLS shows up noisy and strange. Swan arrives like a capital ship. If that's a sequence, then first contact doesn't look like a greeting. It looks like an evaluation. Silence from agencies makes the stomach tighten. NASA, ESA, JPL, careful words at best. No one wants to oversell coincidence or underplay risk. But the sky doesn't care about a messaging strategy. The blackout date is coming. The reappearance will either calm nerves or start new arguments. The worst move we could make right now is to look away and pretend if it's not on TV, it isn't happening. The best is to set the tests ahead of time and let them speak. Here's how this gets decided, not declared. Light curves at high cadence. Do micro pulses and tail brightness keep time after the sun through changing geometry? Spectra across perihelion. Does CO2 stay king while water should wake? Do nickel ion ratios stay skewed no matter how we look? Infrared heat maps. Do day night curves warm and cool naturally or hold suspicious plateaus? Precision astrometry. When we fit gravity, radiation pressure, and jet thrust, do the leftover vectors point steady in a body fixed frame? If you want design, that's where it hides. In math, that refuses to drift. All the while, remember that natural explanations are not boring. CO2 can wake far from the sun and make big kome with little water. Dust grains can be sized and shaped to lie beautifully to your eyes. Vents can cancel lateral pushes if spin and cracks line up just so. Metal fractionation can tilt nickel above iron in places we haven't modeled. Exotic does not equal artificial, but exotic and scheduled is a bigger problem for the ordinary camp than exotic and messy. Mars in this story is more than a bystander. On or near October 3, 3i slash Atlas will pass closest to the red planet. Earth's flagship telescopes can't risk pointing near the sun during the key days. Mars's orbiter scan. MRO can image the coma against black space. Maven can sample plasma and fillies. ExoMars TGO can sniff gases down to faint lines. If any of them catch a true clock in the outflow or an infrared plateau that refuses to follow sunlight, the argument shifts. Curiosity aside, there is a practical risk window. The asteroid belt is not empty. It is a charged, dusty plasma threaded with currents and fields. A coma as enormous as Swan scan twists the interplanetary magnetic field and inject charged dust onto the solar wind's highways. Hit Earth's magnetosphere during a solar storm and you change how auroras dance and how power grids grown. None of this means panic, it means watch the weather. Photon denial is a phrase you may hear quietly. If Swan's glare stays sustained in a specific band, it can saturate optical sensors and carve blind spots. To astronomers, it's glare. To planners, it's masking. If natural, it's a lesson. If engineered, it's a tactic. Either way, it's a reminder that our eyes on Earth, in orbit, in deep space can be fooled by brilliance. 
the part no one loves to say out loud is the simplest. We are not prepared for surprises that ignore our categories. We are magnificent at the things we know how to see, bright, warm, heavy. We are weak against things that are clever, cold or coordinated. Interstellar visitors are telling us the universe is richer than our models. Two of them arriving together are telling us something else. Pay attention. So what happens next? The sun happens. Perihelion will squeeze both visitors. Heat will make honest objects sing. Tail disconnections will rip and reconnect. Jets will turn on and off. If Swan and Three Eyes slash Atlas are exotic but natural, chemistry will drive the show. If control hides under the eyes, schedules and kings will write the story instead. When they reappear, we'll read the curves and let the numbers decide. If you're tempted to find comfort in silence, don't. The sky keeps speaking whether we listen or not. If you're tempted to scream, don't. This is when we measure better, share faster and let evidence outrun ego. We may be witnessing two of the most important astronomical events of our time, either because they expose new physics in stone-cold clarity or because they force us to admit we are not alone. The line between comet and craft is blurring at the edges. So is the line between astronomy and archaeology, between science and the stories we have always told to hold the night at bay. We will need new language, new frameworks, maybe even a new philosophy to hold what we see. But the first step is as old as science. Look, write, wait, test, repeat. As October approaches and both travellers fade behind the sun, pay attention, watch with us, question everything and prepare for what might emerge on the other side. Maybe they pass and minus into the void, leaving us with harder, better questions. Maybe their course changes and their mission truly begins. Either way, Pretending it's nothing is the only mistake we can't afford. If you believe these events demand more than silence, say so. Share the story, leave your theory, tune back in. The next few weeks could change everything we think we know about a place under this very busy sky.